Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karina Wilhelm, Branch Manager at Arizona State University Library and member of the Arizona Library Association Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. And the AZLA Professional Development Committee provide, provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on live transcript and show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Patricia Jimenez will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. And if you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. We'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Please visit www.azla.org for additional information. The Professional Development Committee is seeking proposals for our 2023 webinars. If you have expertise in library science that you would like to share with other libraries and librarians, please consider filling out, a, uh, filling out an application to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in your webinar follow-up email. And I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by AZLA Professional Development Committee. On May 11th, join us for No Shushing Required, Fun Activities in a High School Library with Monica Lorenko. This session will reflect four activities designed to keep the author's school library experience live, alive to the students and teachers as they re-enter the physical school universe, but at the same time follow some social and physical distancing rules. The projects presented in the session are book tasting, lunchtime games, book March Madness, and creative workshops. The presentation will contain a definition of each program and pictures to engage the audience visually. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona Library Association calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. I would like to thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Judith Lozoya for her presentation, Integrating STEM Through Literature. Hello and welcome. My name is Judy Lozoya and I will be your presenter today. Let's get started. So I am from the, I'm Judith Lozoya. I am a professional development facilitator at the Arizona Science Center. And before working for the Arizona Science Center, I was an educator, a teacher for 12 years, middle school science. And um, now I'm on the other side of things, supporting teachers and librarians all throughout Arizona. So let's go ahead and start. Today, we'll be learning about integrating STEM in literature. During today's workshop, you will actively engage in an integrated STEM lesson plan in order to experience natural science connections in a language arts focused lesson plan. And two, utilize the engineering design process to design a solution to a problem identified in literature. Just a few norms, being courteous of others and of our learning environment, 
If you don't know, ask by adding your questions on the chat. And if we don't know, we can find out together. Be engaged and participate, again, using the chat box and take care of yourself. So integrating STEM in literature, whether at school, online, at the library or at home, the need for STEM education remains important for today's youth. In order for children to understand the importance of STEM and how it connects to their futures, it is important to define STEM and its role in education and society. As you participate in today's webinar, we hope to help you better understand STEM and how you can incorporate it in your library activities. My goal today is to provide examples of ways to incorporate STEM throughout your curriculum. So let's get started. Here we have literary elements, which are common, common literary devices found in literature and other texts. We know these help our readers understand and connect to the story and its characters so that our readers get the most out of literature experience. One of our goals as educators is to help students develop an accurate understanding of STEM and what it means to be a scientist, mathematician, or engineer meaning providing them with opportunities to engage in work of actual scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. We can facilitate these experiences by embedding the science and engineering practices into our instruction. Let's explore what science and engineering practices are. Here, you'll notice that it's broken down into three sections. We're gonna focus on blue, which is the science and engineering practices, which we look at as doing science. The green here represents the cross-cutting concepts, like thinking science. And then we have yellow, which is the core idea, the core ideas of knowing science. So Judy, we're gonna, yes? There is a black bar across the top of your okay. slides. I just wanna let you know real quick a black bar. We're wondering if maybe there's a drop down. Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, oh, part of it disappeared. Okay. Oh, there were two, now there's just one. Okay. Um, oh, uh, now it's at the bottom. Let me see if I can hide this. Just you have beautiful slides, we want them to be visible. Um, Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and I'm gonna try again. Is it still there? There are a couple now. A couple black bars. There's one, oh, okay, now there's just a black bar across the bottom, which is, I think maybe okay for some of it. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Um. Okay. But I think I think you can probably keep going. It's just across the bottom. Okay, um, I'm sorry about that. I will also share these slides um, with you at the end and they can be um, sent out if possible. Okay, so let's continue. Um, we'll be focusing on doing science, science, which are the blue. Here, now I can't click over. There we go. Here is the engineering design process, which we'll be using today. If you're not familiar with this, it looks different depending on your, re your source, but this specific one is for teachengineering.org. So we start our engineering design process by asking a question to identify the need and the constraints. So at that time, what is the problem? What have others done? Allowing your readers to research what others have done to solve the problem. Then we take a moment to imagine, what are some solutions that can solve this real world problem? And again, this will make more sense once we continue. Then you allow time for planning. That includes drawing diagrams, determining what materials you will need for the activity, and once that is approved, then students move on to creating the prototype and building the design, testing it out if needed, and allowing them to reflect and improve. 
So today we're going to walk through the engineering design process using a book, a fictional book. Some of you may be familiar with those darn squirrels. We will be listening to the story. I'll stop it about two minutes in and we will identify the real world problem that we will then solve. And now, Those Darn Squirrels. Written by Adam Rubin. Illustrated by Daniel Salmieri. On the outskirts of town, at the edge of the forest, there was a little old house. The only thing older than the little house was the man who lived in it, Old Man Fookwire. Old Man Fookwire was so old that when he sneezed, dust came out. He was also a grump. He hated pie. He hated puppies. The only thing he liked was birds. All summer long, the old man painted pictures of the birds that visited his backyard. There were whirly birds and bonga birds, baba birds and yabba birds. Even a rare flugel bird came by once or twice. Fuquire's paintings weren't very good, but the birds never said anything. When the air turned crisp and the leaves began to change color, the old man grew sad. He knew that soon the birds would fly south for the winter, as they did every year, and that he would be lonely. If he fed the birds, maybe they would stick around. So old man Fuquire built beautiful bird feeders and put them up all around his backyard. He filled the feeders with delicious seeds and berries, and soon birds came from all over the forest just to eat in the old man's yard. But the birds weren't the only ones who liked the bird feeders. The squirrels did too. Not many people know this, but squirrels are the cleverest of all the woodland creatures. In fact, they're fuzzy little geniuses. They can make a house out of a tree, a bed out of a bunch of leaves, and a box kite out of twigs, dirt, and squirrel spit. They are also excellent at math. Winter was fast approaching, and the squirrels needed to gather as much food as they could get ready, so they decided to take some of the bird food. The birds were not happy. Neither was old man Fookwire. When he discovered what had happened, he shook his old man fist and yelled, Oh! I'm sorry about that. But the birds weren't the only ones who liked the bird feeders. The squirrels did too. Not many people know this, but squirrels are the cleverest of all the woodland creatures. In fact, they're fuzzy little geniuses. They can make a house out of a tree, a bed out of a bunch of leaves, and a box kite out of twigs, dirt, and squirrel spit. They are also excellent at math. Winter was fast approaching and the squirrels needed to gather as much food as they could get ready. So they decided to take some of the bird food. The birds were not happy. Neither was old man Fookwire. When he discovered what had happened, he shook his old man fist and yelled, Those darn squirrels! He filled up the feeders again, but this time he hung them from a clothesline. Then he went back inside, confident that the squirrels would no longer be able to get to the seeds and berries. But the squirrels were determined. They devised a plan, and this time they took all the food from the bird feeders. The birds were furious. Humph! 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 yelled a bonga bird. Those darn squirrels! yelled old man Fookwire. Yum, said the squirrels. Now it was old man Fookwire's turn to devise a plan. 
He went to the general store to get supplies. He bought lasers and clamps. He bought wires and springs. He bought all sorts of tools and built a veritable fortress around his bird feeders. Then he refilled them very carefully. Na 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 na, snorted the flugel bird. The squirrels stayed up all night working out their strategy. Okay, stop there. So now we start our engineering design process by starting with our ask. What is the problem in this fictional story? What is this real world problem we are trying to solve? So take a moment, identify what the problem was in the story. Feel free to add it in the chat if you would like. Also identify what have others done? So what was it that Mr. Folkwire did to attempt to try to solve his problem? You can use this QR code for the document that um, I will be using, and you will also receive a copy. So Mr. Folkwire has a big problem on his hands. Let's help him by identifying the problem more thoroughly. Organize your thoughts and ask, what is the problem? Once you've identified that and jot it down, we move on to the next step. Obviously in person, this would be a little bit different and we could all share what we think the problem may be. We now are going to identify the constraints. You're, you're going to create a prototype of a solution. So our problem here is we are trying to feed the birds without the squirrels interrupting that. So your prototype must be between eight to 10 inches in length. Your design must be attractive to birds and scare away the squirrels. But remember, no squirrels may be harmed. You may scare them, but not scar them for life. You will have five minutes to build your prototype. So at this moment, I'd like you to look around your area, if you're at your desk, or in your office, wherever you may be at home, look around your area and identify a few things you can use for your prototype. I will set a five minute timer that will allow you to do that. And you may begin to start putting your prototype together. Again, remember you are feeding the birds and scaring away the squirrels. So before we do that, I want you to imagine what are some solutions you could create. So as you look around your room and your space, based on the items you have available to you, what are some solutions? This is a great opportunity to have students draw, create diagrams, label what it is they'll be using, and making a list of their materials. I always suggest at least two. However, this could look different depending on the age, depending on the book, and depending on time. Once you've taken time to imagine, you then plan. Out of the two options you drew, you create or you choose the best idea from the imagine section. Again, drawing a di diagram and including the labels. Decide what materials needed and list the materials and quantity needed. At this time, if I was doing this with a group of students, I would have, I would make each part of the engineering design process a timed um, process. So five minutes for the question, five minutes for imagine, maybe 10 minutes to plan, whatever um, time frame may work for you. I also 
usher to sign off on their papers. So whatever list of materials they have listed, that is all they may use. Before we move on to our creating, which will be five minutes, I would love to know what items you have found in your area to work or to create your prototype. If you'd love to add that, I'd love to hear that and add it to the chat and Karina will share those with me. Okay, let's get started. I'm going to set a five minute timer. I would like you to create your prototype. Please be creative. And this is just for you to so take your time. As we're going through these five minutes, I'd love for you to also identify how you can implement this in your library and in your workspace as you move forward.
Great. So now I'd like to share a few, just these three pictures. I taught this professional development at the NSTA conference a few weeks ago. And here we have the first group. They looked at it as, again, the clothesline that was created in the story. However, they included cups. And their explanation was if the squirrels were to attempt climbing the clothesline, the cups would, would not allow them to get to the actual food. So it was very creative. They did an awesome job and um, they used the resources they had, which was anything I could find at the local Target. Then we have this group, again, using cups. They used popsicle sticks. They had foil available to them. This is at the very beginning, so I am unsure what their final product actually looked like. Then we have this final group here who chose plates. They then had a stand which was wrapped in foil, which would prevent um, the squirrels from climbing the structure. And then the food would be on top, allowing the birds to then rest on the paper plate. And again, this is a prototype and being as creative as possible. So I'd love to hear what you used and what your design may look like. So please add it on into the chat. And Karina will share that as it comes in. Once the prototype is created and this specific example, there's nothing truly to test except for to review the constraints. Were the birds being fed? Were the squirrels being scarred? And they weren't. So, at, or if they were, this is our time to improve. So again, going back to that engineering design process and allowing students to improve. It does not always include the recreating portion. It could simply be reflecting. So how can I make my design better? We try again. Then allowing them to revise their design, revise their materials, reflecting on what worked well and what didn't work so well. Now I'd like to review the process of the lesson. So STEM is more than just a collective content area signified in an acronym of letters. It is not simply the addition of engineering design process. We need to dive a little bit deeper into planning behind today's experience. Judy, so how, yes. Uh, we, we have had a response from Janelle. Okay. Would you want me to read that out? Yes, I would love to. Okay, she says, pop out bear pictures. When squirrels step in various places, a bear face, claws, et cetera, will pop up. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Great. So how we planned our meaningful standard aligned real world based STEM instruction. Well, this particular experience started when I came across the book, Those Darn Squirrels. I had never read the book before, but I found the title intriguing. After reading the text, I immediately saw the science, technology, and engineering connections. Science, well, we learned about the squirrel's behavior, bird behavior, and needs of living things, interactions amongst different living things. The technology of building devices and using tools to keep squirrels out of the feeders, and the engineering of the characters going through, or of you going through the EDP and attempts to solve the problem. So while the text shared the problem in an obvious fictional way, the problem is a real world base. The struggle is real. How do we keep squirrels and other creatures from eating all the bird seeds? And I love the, the bear idea. This is often an overlooked component of the engineering design process and STEM instruction. Engaging the steps of EDP does not mean our students are engaged in STEM. The EDP is meant to tackle a real world problem 
in an authentic way. It is not meant to be a framework for an activity or a building experience. Once I started to establish that the text was content rich enough to support the STEM instructional sequence, I began to dive into strengthening the STEM connections while adding in meaningful math connections. What in this specific example, I in person, very specific on the measurements and the quantity of the items being used. So um, for example, the math standards here would be length, describing measurable, measurable attributes, measuring the length of an object by selecting and using appropriate tools, and estimating lengths using units of inches. The science here was to observe and ask questions and explain how to specialize certain structures and help them sense and respond to their environment, as well as plan and carry out an investigation to demonstrate ways in plants and animals react to stimuli. So with that said, you will also be receiving a list of books that have real world problems that you could use for an EDP format in your library. Thank you so much for having me today. I would love your feedback. Uh, there is a QR code here on the screen that has a few questions. And at this time, I would love to take questions from you or anything you found interesting about integrating SAM in literature. We did have another um, idea. Um, okay. Bethany says, uh, using a roundabout bamboo built around the trees and place cats on the trees to scare them away. The bamboo serves as the feeder for birds. Yes. Great job. Thank you. And the question that I had had earlier was, um, what ages is this best for? Well, when I looked up the, the specific book, it says three to six year olds. However, this can be used for any age. Um, they're still going through the process and you're just going to find that every age is going to take this and do a little bit different um, when it comes to prototypes. So I taught middle school and I can assure you middle schoolers love photo books. All right, I've got another question here. Um, you mentioned that you used whatever you could find at Target for the <laughs> teachers to design, uh, for the teachers to design. With mm -hmm. students, do you always use physical objects or can you allow them to invent fantastical items that might work? Definitely both. Um, as, an, as a classroom teacher, I had just school supplies. Um, and then if I knew we were doing an engineering design challenge ahead of time, I would always ask for anything they could find at home. And you would be surprised at some of the creations people brought in. So yes, anything is possible. Um, but then there are more structured engineering design challenges where everyone has to use the same supplies. Um, but for something like this, I would allow students to go outside and grab whatever you can find and let's come back and build. So yeah, great question. I had another question. Okay. Um, do you always have them build it or if you're more limited with resources, do you sometimes have them draw and design it instead of actually build it? Oh, definitely. If you're limited in time, I would just go with the drawing and ask for very specific diagram and labeling. Um, and that, that can still be presented. They could still justify why they are creating um, or why they're designing what they're designing. So yeah, paper and pencil is all truly all you need. If you wanna create and make it more hands-on, then yes, building would be the next step.
we'll give it about one more minute. Um, any other questions? Oh, let's see. Uh, what is one of the most creative solutions you have seen students come up with? Ooh, that's a great one. Um, let's see. I had um, students use a long um, <laughs> meter stick, which they used as a branch. And then um, the string was then wrapped in foil. And then it was kind of, it was, it almost looked like a fishing pole. And at the end of the pole was um, where the birds would feed. But I just thought it was creative that they would use other objects as a representation of the tree. So yeah, they could just anything and you'll find that everyone does something different. No project or prototype is the same. And then hearing their um, improvements is always fun because they, one of their improvements will always be better materials or better tape or whatever that may be. They always wanna change what we used and what, what we had available. Thank you. We have another question. Do you find that some students have a difficult time getting started with creating? A hundred percent. Because when it comes to science, or just when it comes to anything in general, um, especially when students are not used to doing engineering design challenges, they can't grasp the idea of, wait, I can try this and it doesn't have to be right. So yeah, it is very difficult at first, um, or it can be difficult for some students. And usually those were the students I would pair, pair up with someone, or um, even if it's something you have to do as a group, just emphasizing and expressing that it's okay to attempt something because that's what scientists do. And you will have the opportunity to reflect. And even if we don't try again, we could talk about what we would do if we did try again. So yes, it can be challenging. And um, the more you do it, the more the students will understand what it truly means to go through the process and what it truly means to be a scientist and make mistakes. Thank you, Judy. Um, do we have any other questions? Please put them in the chat. Right. I have another question. Okay. Um, other than squirrels, do you have any favorite books to use? Ooh, um, my other favorite book to use is I have it on the next. The the most magnificent thing is a very fun one, which is all about the engineering design process. So if you have that on your shelves, I highly recommend. And that's actually a great book to start off with just by reading and um, having a conversation about her struggles throughout the story of her trying to create a design. Um, I can't remember specifically what it is she's trying to create in the story, but she huffs and puffs every time she fails, but she continues and that's what makes um, it's such a great story. So for those students that have a hard time getting started, I would maybe take a step back and start with this book, The Most Magnificent Thing by Ashley Spears, I believe, Spire. We have another question. Um, what is your biggest fail with this type of lesson and how did you overcome it? Um, Definitely materials, just trying to be creative with the items I have available to me, especially when I was in the classroom. Um, so that's when I started asking students to bring in things or um, someone's trash is another person's treasure. And that's usually what my closet, my science closet was all about is was anything anyone 
did not want. But yeah, definitely time and materials. Because though this was quick, third less than 30 minutes um, in person, this and going through the process, it could take a while. So definitely time and materials. Um, let's see, what are your favorite materials to use? And uh, what would you go into a lesson? What would go into a lesson toolkit? And also, I suppose, what were your students, uh, your uh, students' favorite things, to, favorite materials to use? Okay, um, anything when it came to building um, cardboard, popsicle sticks, truly the basics in an art room, um, popsicle sticks, string, um, pipe cleaners, construction paper, felt was a popular one, but an expensive one. Um, cups, plates, anything that could be reused. Is there something that we should never ever provide for the kids? Um, I'm trying to think. We created, I created um, little race cars and I gave them lifesavers as their wheels or as an option. But instead of the mint lifesavers, I only found like the actual hard candy lifesavers. And that was a sticky disaster by the end of it. So, um, just being aware of what you're using and whether your students will put things in their mouth or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question for those that are logged on. What does STEM look like now um, in, your, in your workspace and in your library? Or how do you want it to look? Those are great, great questions. Let's see. And if materials are not um, an option and there's only a short time for a story, this is a great conversation um, to have with your listeners. And that is, okay, what is the problem? What are some things we can do to solve this problem? What would you use to design it? You can truly have a conversation about it without even having to create anything. You could just verbally explain what, or the the children can verbally explain what they would do. And I'm sure you'll get a lot out of that. Um, Sue says, my STEM has now included a maker space, doodler pens, lots of sewing items, and Wednesday afternoon STEM activities. Wonderful. Keep it up. Any other questions or comments? Don't see any more coming in. Um, oh, let's see. Are there ideal STEM activities for maker spaces? Hmm. I think that's a question for you. Ideal activities for maker spaces. Um, anything hands-on, anything where the students are problem solving, um, this would be a great, uh, 
use of our create building in the science center they have tons of ideas which i'm unfortunately not a part of but um anything that the students can tinker with solve possibilities are endless those all sound great all right um Thank you. Judy, so do you have any last thoughts for us before we go? No, I hope you, um, everyone found this helpful. And with the resource that will be shared, I hope that you can implement this into your library. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. Um, and thank you all for being with us today. You will receive an email with a link uh, to the recording of this webinar. And have a wonderful day.